Well, welcome. Uh, we are here tonight to go through session nine, which is John chapter eight. So uh, I want to encourage you to um, take some time here, uh, set the set the craziness of today aside and uh, center in on our study together. Uh, one way we get to do that is we get to pray with each other. So let's pray together. <clears throat> Almighty God, I thank you for this time that you grant us to come together and to sift through your word. Uh, we thank you for the gems that we're going to find. It's good to be curious about your word and to ponder over how uh, a section of scripture like John 8 might be able to change our lives and lives to those to whom we love. Uh, we pray tonight for the Holy Spirit to descend upon our time, to impact our learning, uh, to probe our curiosity and to grant us encouragement for great discussion. It's good to study in your presence, and we offer it to you as worship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <sighs> All right, well, let's get to our open here. Um, when was the last time you were lost? How did you find your way back to where you needed to be? Oh, yeah, phones. <laughs> yeah, fear, you know, about decade and a half ago, this, this question probably would have been a little bit more entertaining to hear, but um, when was the last time you were lost, and how did you find a way back to where you needed to be? The only time I can think of that I was lost was when I was three years old. I was following my brother down the road to go to my go to the farm and I took the first road and it's not till the second road and I ended up at the river and the, the guy that lived there brought me home. <laughs> <laughs> a good a good Samaritan bringing you home. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Anybody else have any entertaining stories about getting lost? With GPS you never get lost anymore. That's true. It might take you someplace different. <laughs> but even with the map you really, if you had somebody go pilot, you really didn't get lost. No, you didn't. If you had a map and knew how to yeah. read it, and yeah. knew how to yeah. read it, yeah. that's the well, secret. No one's skill. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm about to throw my wife hard under the bus. So, um, we are in the age where GPS is supposed to take care of you. And then you hedge your bets and go, all right, well, if that fails, then at least I have my co-pilot. And uh, Kayla, if you if you do wind up uh, listening to this, I do love you, but <laughs> you and I both know you've earned the right of terrible navigator. So um, the one one trip that sticks out in my mind is is uh, yeah. Well, we ne we never got lost. We never got lost in Kentucky. Uh, actually, actually, we got lost in Pittsburgh, and um, we were we were down there and. Uh, we were we were on a trip down there and uh, things things were going really good and uh, we were we were there for a concert and we needed to get out of where we were. The problem was there's so much construction down there and if you've ever been to like where the stadiums are down there in Pittsburgh where the rivers meet, the roads are like so interchangeable and they twist and turn with each other and you, the off ramps are so quick and. Uh, sometimes your GPS like doesn't like the words don't keep up with it. So you need a navigator to tell you like, okay, not this one, but the next one. And, uh, Kayla has earned the reputation of not being good at that. <laughs> and I get super bad because <laughs> I'm like, just read what the map says. And, uh, one night we were down there trying to get to where we needed to be. And we, took a wrong turn. We were trying to get out of Pittsburgh and then we wound up taking an off ramp and it ended us right back in. And we found ourselves <clears throat> in the middle of the night in a part of Pittsburgh that you do not want to be in. And it was kind of one of those moments where you just kind of reach over and you lock your doors and you hope for the best. Um, so, so that was a, uh, a, a grand adventure we had to find our way out of. Um, yeah, I was on a trip like that. I, 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 I felt your stare. I knew, I knew, I knew you were going to say it. Uh, 
I was on a trip like that with Adam once. And uh <laughs> late at night and we're in the wrong hotel. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Remember the night that we got the GPS took us to this dead end street? If we could see the hotel we were supposed to oh, be yeah. in. But we could get there from here. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's so close. Yeah, it's so I close. Like, it's <laughs> I took a trip to New York to see the one we with my singles group. It was a Christian singles group. And we had different Christian churches and things we were going to go to for a weekend trip. And it was when GPS was just fairly new. So it was years ago. And they were navigating with the GPS, and we had seen uh, the site for the tower for the 9-11, and we had done New York things, and, and we were ready to go home, and we were all sad because that was our last thing, was the 9-11 thing. And um, so they put the GPS on, and here's, you know, and we had this big van that we rented, and it's saying, da, da 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 turn this, turn that, turn that. And she's like, our leader, fearless leader, she says, this doesn't quite feel right. I don't think this is right. And it, we ended up in the middle of a gay parade. Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, and when we realized it, we're like, and she goes, where's my Jesus band? <laughs> 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 fly <it> from there. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, I was like, oh, my. <laughs> and, and then the GPS just went crazy on us, you know, because who anticipates a parade, I guess. Like, yeah. Really tripped them <laughs> up. I don't know. But. Oh, man. So that yeah. was totally lost for when I yeah. was just a victim in the car. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, one more and then we'll get going. So um, in college, uh I was I was at school on a rare weekend because <clears throat> before Kayla I would I would hang out with my buddy we'd go over to Red Line and uh, spend time in his parents' house but it was just one one typical it it, it was a rarity for me to be at home and not do that uh, to be to be at the dorm and uh, we had this really small tight knit friend group and this one girl was like I. I I, I want to go to, there's like a huge Salvation Army Depot, like right on the edge of Philadelphia. And she's like, I want to go. And I'm like, I don't want to travel from Lancaster to Philadelphia just to do that. Like, I think that's silly. And I'm not so pumped about doing this road trip. And... She begged a little while longer, and then she got her, her friend to agree with her, and I was like, all right, I think I'm outmatched. All right, let's get in the car. Let's go. So we go, and <laughs> we're, we're on our way, and we get to the point where, like, you got to either – if you've ever seen the Goofy movie, you know – there's, there's a point in this trip where you either turn left or right, and it's going to dramatically change the outcome of the trip, and – we chose left and we should have chose right. And so we chose left. We go down this huge, huge off ramp, turn the corner, go on a bridge. And I'll never forget it. It's like the city just boom. And it opens up like right in front of you and just sort of out of nowhere. Like now we're in downtown Philadelphia. And about that time I was, she discovers, she's like, Oh, they're closed today. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, one, we're not going to where we thought we were going to go. We're lost. And two, you probably should have had that information before we, you know, invested this much time on this journey that this was going to be closed. Um, I think she just wanted to spend time with the group. So uh, right when we pull into Philadelphia, my gas light turns on. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, dang. And we're... We're like bebopping down the road. I've never been to downtown Philly in my life. Like I look down the street, you can see like the the big hall and stuff, and you know saw saw like Forty Second Street and like like we were in it, right? And there's buildings as 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 high as high can be, and we and there's so I'm like 
we need to look for a gas station because I'm going to run out of gas. And there's like taxis flying everywhere and people moving around. <laughs> and she's like, there's a 7-Eleven right down this block. And I was like, okay, we beep out down the road. It's a storefront. <laughs> and it, it's not a gas station. It's just the 7-Eleven, like, if you want a slushie, come on in. And the thing we found out very, very quickly, in downtown Philly, there are no gas stations. It's just, like, building after building after building. So I was like, we got to find a way out of here because I I don't even know. I don't even know where the nearest gas station is. I, like, it ain't here. So we meander down like one way roads and eventually like piddle on back to to the highway <sighs> i got that sucker down to two miles to empty and i'm looking at it we finally make it back to the highway and i'm like you need to look for a gas station and pray it's within like three miles and i will pop this thing in neutral and do every trick in the book to try to get this to where it needs to go and sure enough it was like four miles away and I'm like, you better pray we get to this gas station. And we coasted probably about half of that distance to this gas station in neutral down the highway. And we just barely petered on in, on in. And I was like, I don't care what you thought you were going to do with your day. We are going to get gas and stop tempting fate. And we're going to go back to the dorm. And so <laughs> that's exactly what we did. But our GPS bailed us out that day. So, in this session, Jesus divides humanity into two categories. Those who have the light of, of life and those who walk in darkness. If we don't trust in Jesus, we are lost in darkness. But he does not leave us in darkness to find our own way. Instead, he offers himself as our light, life, and true freedom. I'm going to read the first section for you out of John 8, and then I'm going to ask two volunteers to read those next sections, uh, 28 through 38 and then 48 through 59. So if we can flip over to John 8. I will begin. All right, this is John 8. <clears throat> I find it weird that they leave out verse 1, which is simply, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Um, all right, John 8, uh, first 20 verses. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst, and they said to her, him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote in the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, and I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written, well, that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who bears, excuse me, who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me or nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Those words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. All right, can I have somebody read verses 28 through 38? 
So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. As He was saying these things, many believed in Him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in my word, you are my true disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is, how is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Thank you. Can I have somebody else read 48 through 59? The Jews answered him and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and, he, and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him, and if I say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. All right. So three key teachings from Jesus. And uh, now we're going to see what Dr. Evans has to say in terms of the teaching here tonight. Uh, pay attention to the questions. Uh, write them, write answers to them down as he speaks, and then jot down anything else that you find interesting about the video, and be prepared to talk about it uh, when it's when it's all wrapped up. So uh, let's pay attention to what Dr. Evans has to say. chapter demonstrating how awesome our Lord is as he deals with the religious leaders who were constantly trying to trap and trick him. They bring before him in the first section of the chapter a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. They were trying to put him in a no-win situation. If he didn't agree that she should be killed, then he would be disagreeing with the law of Moses. But then if he killed her, or at least supported her death, they would not be showing the love of God that he proclaimed to show. So as far as they were concerned, they had him. Well, so they thought. First of all, they made a big mistake. If she was caught in the very act, that means there was a man somewhere in the vicinity, and they only brought the woman, which showed that they were not serious about the solution to the problem and the act of judgment. 
Second problem is they didn't know who they were talking to. Jesus takes his finger and writes in the sand twice. Why? Because God took his finger and he wrote on two tablets of stone to give the Ten Commandments. Since they brought up the law of Moses, Jesus is showing them who wrote the law of Moses. Not only his father in the Old Testament, but the son, because the son is the word of God. And so they were face to face with the law of God. And if they were going to use that law to condemn this woman, that same law would be used to condemn them. So if you're living in a glass house, don't throw stones because they're going to come back at you. And if you don't want to be judged because of your sin, then you better be careful about judging others because of theirs. It says one by one, from the youngest to the oldest, they drifted away because they did not want to be under the condemnation that they themselves were giving this woman. In fact, there's another principle here. You could not judge a person for a sin you yourself had committed. So that tells us a lot about their lifestyle as well. But the beauty of this story is what happens with the woman. He comes to the lady and he asks her, where are your accusers? She says, they're not here, they're gone. Well, I don't accuse you either. I'm not going to condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, the reason you need to know that is he takes away her condemnation prior to telling her how to live her lifestyle from that point on. You see, when you've been set free, it's a lot easier to obey. When you've been delivered, it's a lot easier to submit to the power and will of God. And so by removing the condemnation, she was incentivized to obey the Lord. And isn't that just like our Savior? Well, this leads into a deeper discussion by the Lord to the religious leaders about who he really is. He claims himself to be the light. He says in verse 12, I am the light of the world. Jesus came to show how dark darkness is by being the light himself. And when he came with his words and his works, it demonstrated he was truth and the religious leaders were false. In fact, he says that because they did not respond to him, they didn't even know his father. That tells us a lot. To reject Jesus is to reject God the Father. To negate God the Son is to marginalize God the Father. Many people say, well, I believe in God while they reject Jesus. Can't happen. Because the Father and Son are intimately and intricately tied, connected, and wielded to one another. And so Jesus makes it clear that their rejection is going to lead to their judgment and that they are in fact going to die in their sins verse 24 says that they're going to place themselves in the position of eternal judgment because they're rejecting clear light <coughs> who sits in a room that's blazing bright and then still declares it's dark well, that's what they were doing because they had seen his works they had heard his words they had seen what he could do, and yet they were still rejecting him against the backdrop of full light. When God reveals himself to you through his word, through your experiences, through things and people he brings your way, and he clearly presents himself as the truth, then to reject that is to reject the light, which only means you're insisting on darkness and you're placing yourself in a position of judgment. He goes on and he tells them that they have an option. He begins in verse 31 in this powerful statement that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He wants them to know that you can be delivered from the bondage, handcuffs, and chains of sin. But you can't deliver yourself. He who the Son sets free. Coming to Jesus Christ and trusting him as Savior and then following him as Lord becomes the key that unlocks the chain so you can be released from sin's stranglehold on your life. To reject Jesus Christ is to say, I still want to stay incarcerated or to lean on your own human weaknesses to try to set yourself free. But Jesus says, not only will I set you free, I will set you free indeed. Let me say a word about indeed freedom. 
That means show enough freedom. That means uh, unmistakable freedom. That means uh, like when Jesus rose from the dead and it was said he has risen indeed. He really is not here. Jesus concludes this chapter with a stunning statement. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, I am. That is a claim to deity. He takes the same identification that God gave to Moses when Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God said, you tell him, I am sent you. The eternally self-existent one. That's who Jesus claims to be. He claims to be the very God of the Old Testament who pre-existed Abraham and was the God who actually called Abraham, who these religious leaders identified with most. Here is one of the great claims in scripture of deity by the Lord himself about himself. He has no shame in claiming his pre-existence eternal role as Yahweh of the Old Testament. So in chapter 8, you get to see Jesus at his best because you see his compassion, you see his direct condemnation of error, you see his view of sin, and you see his claim of deity. What a master we serve. What a great God we have. John chapter 8 is a really fun chapter. It reveals to us a lot about <clears throat> the personhood of Jesus through, like, really approachable narratives. Um, there are many selections of scripture. We talked about this. Uh, we, we talked about some of them, actually, last night at our gathering, uh, <laughs> watching The Chosen, uh, which takes place every Tuesday from 6 to 7 o'clock. You should totally come. Um, it, it we we talked about how there's there's many many lessons of Jesus that don't have a a setting and they're they're parables or they're they're similes to his deity and to life itself and they're sort of uh they're they're easy to teach but people on their own maybe new Christians you know those stories about Jesus are sort of sort of hard to approach without any any prior knowledge. Um, these are narratives. These are these are stories playing out right before us. Um, the, they're easy to follow. There's there's a beginning and then there's a conflict and then Jesus fixes the conflict. Uh, John chapter eight is just filled with three awesome stories that are super easy to read and really easy to approach. So it's a really fun chapter to go over. All right, why does it seem like the Pharisees don't care about justice with the woman caught in adultery? You pick that up from you pick that up from the uh, the video at all? Because they only brought the woman back and not the man who was okay. How's that crazy? I mean takes two to tango, right? That's the that's the old adage, and they only got half the party there. Wasn't the law that both of them mm -hmm. to be Yeah. They just wanted to trip him up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they wanted to trip Jesus up. And it's funny because our scriptures actually say that, right? They're like, they're only doing this because they want to bring a charge against Jesus. That's it. They're like nothing else. Have you ever... Uh, Have you ever been so passionate about like executing justice that you didn't really care about the feelings of the individual? I know that um, as a new parent, as as a new parent now to toddlers, uh, my kids are exceptionally good at pushing my buttons and making sure that rebellion is a part of their everyday life. And uh, making sure that when they do wrong, they keep doing wrong. Uh, because they're very, in their minds, super rational about why they want to do the things they want to do. And sometimes dad is hyper-focused on, I'm going to correct you, and I'm going to tell you why you're wrong, and then I'm going to put you in timeout. 
And poor little Emmett, like, he just needs talk through. And he, like, I miss the person there in, in my pursuit of justice. Uh, I think the Pharisees are, are sort of caught in that as well, right? They're like, so bent on executing judgment so that Jesus gets tripped up. That there is a literal human life in their hands. And they miss it. Can a person believe in God while rejecting Jesus? Man, is that a lie the world wants you to believe, right? <laughs> well, don't the Muslims? Mm. Uh, not the God we serve. Um, <laughs> um, and there's there's a, a number of... Uh, There are a number of offshoots of Christianity that involve a part of our trinity. The easy ones to go to are Judaism and Islam, and because um, they're all Abrahamic religions. The fact of the matter is that Christianity is is it's the total package religion. Like it's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Period. You miss one, you miss them all, and there's there's no there, there's no in between, and we know that to be truth. Um, there are some like creationists, uh, like Nash. Uh, I don't want to call them Nash. Naturalists, maybe that's probably the right phrase for them. They they hyper analyze the creator. And that's who they believe in. Um, and they look at Jesus and they go, eh, yeah, he was, he was a guy. And they miss so much about who, who the triune God is because they reject Jesus. You cannot believe in the one true God and reject Jesus. It's impossible. How about Jewish people? They do too. What about the Unitarians? They believe in everything. They they <laughs> they are the hardest people in, in my in my personal opinion, um, and it, it it hits close to home for us because we we have members in our family that are a part of that. Um, it's it's hard to evangelize to Unitarians because they'll just agree <laughs> with you with everything. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, that's true." And in, in a in in a Unitarian belief system, their pursuit is is utopia, which is well, we can all get along, we can all coexist, and we can all do what well, we'll be okay as as long as we all get along. Well, I read the Quran, and it tells me that if you don't believe in Allah, you're an infidel, and you're supposed to kill those people. It's in the Quran. Um, I have a copy in my office. Um, the The fact of the matter is, is that if you really believe that, you being in a building with somebody else who doesn't believe in you, that's, that's illogical. It doesn't make sense. But a Unitarian would go, ah, we just love, we just love everybody. Where at the core of many belief systems, that's not the case. Um, so it is it is hard to look at any other belief system, right? And to and to, to just look at another human being, it's it's hard to to say, you know, you're wrong, you're wrong, uh, or you or to as as you brought up mu Muslims and Jews to say you don't have the whole story, or you have part of the story wrong in in, in terms in terms of Islam. Um, you know, the blessing, <laughs> you're so close, but the blessing didn't go through the child you think it goes through. Um, and, uh, but as Christians, like we have to stand on the truth and, and understand like this is life and death period. If, if we're not the ones, the church proclaiming it, we are not living into the great commission that Jesus trusts us with. So, um, Gotta get the whole story. Gotta get the whole story. Now the good news 
in terms of Judaism, we know the end of the book. And God says, ah, I'm not done with you yet. And he's got a plan for the remnant, those who remain, that he'll take care of them. But um, not yet. They don't have they don't have the full story. Um, in what ways does Jesus express his divinity in this chapter? He declared that he was, I am. I am. I love it. No shame. I love how chapter eight ends, right? He's just like, I am. <laughs> and wanted to stone him. They it, knew exactly what that meant. Yeah. 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 And uh, he's, he's unapologetic about it. I mean, that's like a mic drop moment for Jesus where they're like, you're not, you, you're just a young whippersnapper. There's no way you know who Abraham is. And he's like, I'm, I not only knew Abraham, but I knew the people who came before Abraham. Before Abraham, I was. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you're just a young boy. Uh, and yet. Jesus proclaims his divinity. Yeah. All right. Flip over your papers. Let's get to the scriptures. In the first 11 verses is where our first question is found. Jesus did not have to choose between following the law and showing compassion to the woman caught in adultery. <clears throat> we had a small gathering last night that happens every Tuesday. Uh, it's called the the Chosen Study. It happens from six to seven o'clock. You you might have heard about it. Um, we we actually brought this up uh, last night at said study. You should totally come. Um, Is this the one that was on Sunday night? The Chosen. No, it's the Chosen takes place every Tuesday night. So. Right here. Here. On TV. On TV. No, I don't think so. Sunday. Oh, I it's not on TV right now. They haven't released the new season. But yeah, it, it's on TV. I'm not, I'm not sure where it airs or what it's time it airs because it's on a couple different places. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's. It, Angel Studios has it on. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's that show. And we, we take the Bible and we watch that show and we compare what's on the screen. Um, but anyway, we talked last night about how there's this scene where Nicodemus is talking to talking to a, a Pharisee colleague, and the the colleague is looking at Nicodemus and he's questioning and he, he's like, "Well, you know, why what what happens if God does do this new thing and and we we have to break the law of Moses?" And Nicodemus looks at him and says, "Well, why can't we do both?" Right? What? Why would God be leading us into sin? Why can't we do both? Why can't God make a pathway we can do both? Here, Jesus is living that out. He's not breaking the law, and he's living into his nature. He's doing both. Um, so he's following the law, and he's showing compassion to the woman. It came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill the law and to show compassion to sinners. So he's doing both. This wasn't a no-win situation. It was the perfect way for Jesus to show the Pharisees and his audience what he was all about. In what ways does Jesus acknowledge her sin and, sh and show her compassion? So Jesus is clearly showing both sides of the coin here. How is he doing that? Yeah, so that's that's like the main thing, right? Where he lives into his authority and he he doesn't he's not there to stone her. And yet he knows there is a right way to live and you're not doing that. So I'm here to tell you you need to do that. Um I like the he said that uh, it's easier to obey when condemnation is taken away. Mm. So he takes away the condemnation for her, and then he said, then he tells her how to live in just a couple mm -hmm. words. Today's church, really, especially like the American church, we love like the whole freedom in Jesus movement, and it's like. You don't have to be ashamed of anything you've ever done. Like, you're welcome. You can come in here, and it's great because Jesus loves you. 
But then they missed the second part, which like the first part's awesome and it's true. And you should promote it and you should love it because the gospel provides freedom to know that my guilt and my shame over things I've done, if I come to Jesus, God wipes that clean. And there is a second part to it, though, which is go and sin no more. Right. All, all of my all the condemnation I'm piling on myself or I think I deserve. God takes that away. But then he also instructs, right? This is what living a Christian life, this is what living like Jesus looks like. You should do that. Now, we're not going to get it right all the time, but it does come after. It makes it easier for us to go, oh, okay, well, I'll try that then. Um, Jesus shows us an ancient example of that here. What are your thoughts on that? Getting rid of the condemnation first, allowing freedom to happen, and then instruction. That might make her trust him a little more if he lets her free and then tells her what to do. Yeah. He's not coming over to just boss her around. There's also this... There's also a problem that happens if you put the cart before the horse, so to speak, here, where if Jesus goes, this is, go and sin no more. This is how you're going to live your life. And then I will give you freedom. Well, now we're just like every religion that's ever been made, right? It's all about what you do. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Every single religion that has ever been thought of by man is transactional, just like what Steve said. I do this, so I get this. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not do that. God acts first. God loves first. God intervenes <laughs> first. God sets free first, then instructs. It's all on God. And we can see an ancient example of that here. Verse 12, be bopping down your page, introduces us to Jesus' second I am statement. Just like when he called himself the bread of life, he calls himself the light of the world, using a natural illustration to reveal supernatural truth. Based on verse 12, what do you think it means for Jesus to be the light of the world? Can I have somebody read verse 12? And Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So, what do you think it means for Jesus to be the light of the world? Claiming to be the source of spiritual truth and guidance. Hmm. Is there an alternative? No. <laughs> yeah. He is. He's it. Have any of you have ever, like, ventured into a cave before? What about Penn's Cave? Have you ever been there before? Um... <clears throat> I was going to take this conversation more in like the spelunking, th spelunking kind of area, but I've only ever done that once and I will never do it again. Um, but I will go back to Penn's Cave because it's pretty cool and it's stocked with enormous fish. So, um, so anyway, go to Penn's Cave. Um, I'm sure many of you have like walked down the stairs before and you've done the cave tour. And you get in the boat and at first when you're going into the cave, like things are... Things are good, right? You like see the see the walls, and they're talking about stalagmites and stalactites, and they're talking about how the cave was formed and how there was a flood, and people were, you know, people explored the one end of the cave, and then eventually they found the other end of the cave, and it's a really nice tour. But the further away you get from the dock, what happens? It gets dark, 
It gets, it gets really dark. Really dark. And um, there's a really cool spot in the tour where you enter into this big cavern and all around you there's stalagmites and stalactites that that look like things like a, a nittany lion even a, a dragon and you know a miner and uh you know just really cool really really cool it's kind of like looking at a cloud and saying oh that looks like that well the only way you're able to see it is they have this really neat like contraption in there where the person in the boat has a light switch basically and all the co- all these colors come on. Have, have any, any of you ever seen that where the cave like turns a bunch of colors? And then suddenly you can see again. It's like, oh, oh, like, man, this, this place is really beautiful. And I wouldn't be able to see that unless I turn the light switch on. Jesus here in this passage is saying, you're not going to be able to see the beauty of this world, this world that I have made, unless if you follow this light. Otherwise, you're just going to be in a cave, alone, in the dark, thinking you see the whole picture, but really you're not. Um, where in your life have you followed that light of Jesus, and it has led you somewhere beautiful? Like you were wandering around for a while. And you finally put it all at Jesus' feet and you go, all right, whatever happens, happens. And then he takes you somewhere you never thought you'd go. He took me to prison. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you started looking around the room, Vicky, and I was like, I'm pretty sure she's going to say prison. And uh, <laughs> Okay, we'll flesh that out for us here. I mean, I've found so much beauty in the people that are in prison that, you know, we label people that are in prison, and it's not what they are. They're, they're just like you and me. You know, they made some mistakes and some big mistakes, some of them, you know. Yeah. But, you know, but their souls have, you know, their, their faith in God is so much stronger sometimes. Yeah. Than the people that are out here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The light shines brightest in the most darkest of spots. And I would definitely be one of them. And they would tell you if it wasn't for the fact that they were in prison, they would have never found God. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I heard, I think it was in the movie, God's Not Dead, the first one. Scientifically, darkness is only the absence of light because light is energy. And yeah. Life as we know it. But darkness is a, is just the absence of light. It's not. Yeah, it doesn't exist it doesn't on its exist own. Exist on its own. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's who wants to be in darkness. Yeah. And, you know, that's a scientific fact. So that should that should you know get somebody who is just a scientist. And <laughs> I always Thinking. Try to remember that. That thing, if I come across just the scientists, talk to them about. <laughs> God used uh, light to lead the Israelites out of um, Egypt. I'm so proud of you. Uh, yes, yes. And that's it's interesting because this takes place at the feast of booze, and the Israelites celebrate the feast of booze. Booth, the O O T H. Booths. Thank you. Um, that was to commemorate their journey through the wilderness when they lived in tents, and they had the pillar of light yep. following by night. And yep. And here he is, the last day, seventh mm-hmm. or eighth day of the Feast of Booze, saying, "Ta-da! I'm the light." <laughs> we were talking about the feasts before y'all yeah. came in here, so. <laughs> I've been studying that along with this, and it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. 
So, you know, context matters. This is this is why he's teaching on this because it's on the minds of everybody there, right? Yeah. Uh, That's what they, and that last day is their holy convocation. So they're all at the It's like us going to a NASCAR race and Jesus showing up saying, I'm the Sunoco that makes the car of life go. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like we're already thinking about it, so we might as well talk about it, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, Definitely uh, a, a tried and true statement from Jesus. I, I love, I love how Steve picked it up because this is how I was going to end this question. Um, it's not something that simply exists from this moment on with Jesus. The Father has already shown that this is how He works through the Old Testament at this feast. The reason why they're remembering is because God's been light forever and has shown to Israel that. This he is a guiding force in life. Uh, he'll get you out of the darkness, and uh, oftentimes he illuminates the way. So, yeah, good good job from all of you. That was that was a great conversation. In verses twenty through twenty seven, Pharisees prove <clears throat> that they are walking in darkness, uh, not on sunshine. They are lost, unable to understand Jesus or the hope he is offering to them. Their ignorance ultimately is a terrible tragedy. It can be easy, easy to vilify people who reject us, but we must remember that apart from Christ, people are walking in darkness. How do you think you would treat a Pharisee if you met one today? Well, there's a guy over there with a lot of thoughts rattling around in his mind. He doesn't hide it at all. You want to play a good game of poker, you go find him. Uh, <laughs> Anybody? Well, if Jesus was talking, I'd shush him like the guy did. Jesus said one time, you know, do as they say, not as they do. <laughs> it is, um, he. <laughs> Here we have a group of people who know up here the law, but cannot see it or feel it in their hearts, it being lived out and fulfilled right in front of them. You know, they are so close and yet so far away. Um, those, those folks, we know of them in our lives who are just so close and understanding the goodness of the gospel, and yet miss it. Those people just, this is Zach speaking, they frustrate me more than people who just outright reject Jesus. Because I'm like, ah, like, just get it already. And like, God has shown you so many times. He, he wants to make himself known. Like, why don't you get it? And yet nothing. Nothing. It's easier to evangelize the people who outright reject God versus people who are halfway there and refuse to see the other half. Because they're like, oh, yeah, I already know that about God. Like, yeah, but he wants to have a relationship with you. He's, he's not just some far off God in the sky that created everything. You know, the people that say, oh, I believe in a God. Well, they're halfway. They're, well, technically, they're a third of the way. They're a third of the way there. And yet they miss it they miss it and they're so frustrating it's so frustrating and the pharisees are much like that yeah i do think it's important that we share the truth with them and allow them to know that jesus loves them mm -hmm. yeah and yeah they'll frustrate us because they'll throw scripture at us mm -hmm. but we need to know the truth yeah so that we can throw that back at them yeah yeah you know, and, and talk about grace. Mm. What do you mean when you say a third? Oh, the Trinity. Like people, people who would argue, like I know of God. Like I know there, there is a God out there, and a lot of those folks are not comfortable with being an atheist. Of uh, one, one of my favorite apologetic uh, studies is it takes faith to be an atheist, and it it walks down the road of like. 
hey, you're going out on a lot of limbs here if you want to believe this, because a lot of an atheist's theology is the world came to be, the universe came to be from nothing. Well, how do you explain that? Oh, I can't. I can't. It just did one day. Well, have we ever been able to replicate it? Well, no. Well, then the the shade off of that is I don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I can't explain us all being here. So there had to have been a creator at some point, some being in the sky that we don't know anything about. It's like, ugh, okay. At least you're giving credence that somebody got the ball rolling at some point. That's one third of the Trinity. Now we need you to get you on board to knowing that third a little bit more and the two thirds that you don't know anything about. Um, and and those, those folks approach faith with such uh, dismissiveness. They're like, ah, I'm not going to be able to get to know them. So, eh, whatever. I guess logically it makes sense. There's those in our churches that are so righteous and judgmental. You got to take the that time. They don't have Jesus in their heart. Mm. They have all the knowledge up here, but not really. Yeah. So that's the other end. So that's the Pharisee, right? Who, who is? Gotcha. Yeah. Who who know the law? They know God's commands. They know what it's like to be a Christian. And yet their personal relationship to Jesus is non-existent and their grace that they extend to others is limited because the power of the spirit is, is as we talked about last week with the whole rivers thing, um, that, that spigot ain't on all the way. Um, yeah, those, I mean, when you talk about evangelism, Across the board, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what audience you talk to. You're always going to run into some frustration. And so, when when you meet anybody who thinks differently than we do in terms of Christianity, we got to lean on grace and we have to lean on patience and just err on the side of God's strength because it's going to take a while. Unless if God just you know whacks somebody across the head and says, "I'm here," which does happen, but it more likely than not, it's going to take time. Um, so don't grow impatient. Verse 31 through 38. Good discussions here tonight. Good job. In verse 31, Jesus tells us what it means to walk in the light. If we follow his teaching, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. What teaching have we learned from Jesus so far in John? What can you do this week to follow Jesus' teaching? So what out of John so far has really like stuck with you through this lesson? And how are you trying to remember that as we continue along? Well, for me... Oh, go ahead. In the first part here, he basically is telling them when they brought the woman for the adultery, you can point your finger at them, but you got four more points back at you. Aha. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. um, yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, <coughs> slow to judge. It's an important lesson that we can keep in the back of our minds as we live throughout our week, especially for those of us who interact with a whole bunch of different people on any given day. Um Never know who you're going to rub elbows with. Different cultures, different lifestyles. Yeah. Everybody comes into the post office, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, especially. I know. <laughs> I lived in Mount Carmel for a long time. <laughs> I'm sorry to anybody from our audience that might be living in. Shemokin. So we we love you and God loves you too. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Slow to judge. That's a good lesson to take from from our lesson from John that could impact how you live. Anybody else? Just in John eight here, I gleaned some points that Jesus actually tells us how to be disciples. Mm. 
and in one of these verses, in 12, he says, follow me, I am the light of the world. In 19, he says, know my father, know me. And 24, believe. And 31, 32, continue is my version, but mm -hmm. yours was different. Continue in my word. 42, love me, love my father, love me. And 47, hear. That's the, the, their whole problem was they didn't, they weren't hearing him. You know, they heard him, but they rejected him. They weren't hearing him. And um, 52 is to keep my word. So. Yeah, good stuff he there. He was teaching them how to be disciples, and they were not listening. Yeah, good stuff there. I think I think John in general, I, I told you when we first started, you know, John chapter 3 is, is obviously a book in the Bible that many of us know, but I really enjoy John chapter 1. When we first got into John chapter 1, I talked to you about how John starts like a, a Star Wars movie where the words start to roll up from the screen. It's like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And um, that those first like eight verses in John 1 like stick with me because I'm a big nature guy. And although I don't like campfires, um, <laughs> I am a big nature guy. And, you know, it's that scripture that reminds me like, Apart from him, nothing was made. So everything I enjoy about this broken world around me that God is eventually going to make more beautiful one day is all because of Jesus. And that grants me joy. So there's tons of lessons here in the book of John that can dramatically change your life every day. It can put a smile on your face. And uh, it's a really approachable book of the Bible to, to grant some joy from. The Judeans, this is your last question here, who did not trust Jesus rejected him instead of admitting they were sinful. Despite the rejection, Jesus endures with the crowd and answers the questions, even when the questions were meant to be or were meant as insults like verse 48. Can I have somebody read verse 48? The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon. So, uh, I don't know every one of your stories, but I, I, I mean, I've never been accused of such terrible things. <laughs> and I would venture to guess uh, most people haven't been accused of harboring a demon before. Um Oh, man, mm, that's a rabbit hole I can not afford to go down right now. But um, if you want to hear a really funny story about being accused of having a demon, you, you tug my shoulder after this, and I will gladly tell you probably one of the most funny stories I've ever had visiting a church before. Um, you know, these folks are, are looking at Jesus, like, trying to tell him the most nastiest things they could possibly say to him. And yet he gives them an audience. And he seeks to answer their questions. He's patient, right? Even with the most vile people trying to insult him. What can you learn from Jesus' behavior towards this hostile crowd? Like, they hate him. They do not want him there. And yet, he's still there. Any lessons you can learn out of that? I think there's a few. Well, he doesn't give up. Yeah, God doesn't give up, right? Talked about that last, you know, last Sunday, right? Jesus sitting at a table, imparting wisdom, sharing his time, and then you got all the disciples bickering about something that doesn't matter, and instead of being offended and walking away, Jesus stays and teaches them and loves them and shares meal with them and serves them um, because he loves them. 
And God here does the same thing where people are showing them, showing God their nastiest side, and yet he's still there. But he answered the question, I'm not demon possessed. Yeah, he's truthful. He's here to glorify the Father. Yeah. Yeah. So he doesn't give up on the crowd. He's not afraid to speak the truth. Anybody else? He knows who he is. Jesus is really secure in who he is. You're absolutely right. He's unapologetic about it. And how many times as Christians do we get afraid of saying who who's on, who, whose side we're on? You know, in a world where we don't want to offend people. Or get shot by people. Or, or get shot by people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, getting on the wrong side of Pittsburgh. Um <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Some of you might have remembered when we came here first before, I had a car all painted up, all turned into Yeah. Maybe. That we let the youth group paint up. Yeah. I got a lot of comments on that. Well, yeah, tell me more. It was before me. You, you got <laughs> <laughs> to. I got to know. Turkey <laughs> Valley. Turkey Valley, when we were youth leaders over there. Uh, I let the youth group paint my Volkswagen Jetta. My daily driver. Mm. Uh, and they painted a big smile face on the hood and verses on the side. And I, love, I have pictures of it. But, that's cool. Uh, and that's where I drove probably for a long time. Four, five years, a long time until I ran into somebody with it. <laughs> But yeah, you get the comments. Until you what? Until I rear end of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not whacking people across the head with the Bible. You're just driving through them. Uh -uh. <laughs> but you got a lot of other comments too that yeah. didn't bother me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so he's he's very secure in who he is. He's very unapologetic about it. It should teach us to do the same as sinners saved by grace, looking at the personhood of Jesus and going, you know, he's given me a free gift and I should just rejoice and be ready to proclaim why I am the way I am. Um, I think that passage also shows the world can be mean, um, Paul warns us, if you're going to love him, the world's going to hate you. And he's true. It's true. And that's why, like, going back to the, man, we're just, we're just tying everything back together, aren't we, right now? We got, we got Pittsburgh. We, now we're, now we're going back to the Unitarian discussion that we had earlier. That's why, like, I look at these groups who say, oh, if we can just get along, we'll be okay. I'm like, well, that's not how the world works, though. I mean, God even tells us that's not how the world works until he comes back and fixes it himself. Like, we're not going to be able to do it. Only God is going to be able to do that. And uh, to, to have scriptures like this sort of affirm, like, there's just going to be ugly, mean people who hate the truth, who, man, I'm on a roll right now. I'm going, I'm going, yeah, who'd rather just sit in the dark, who who would prefer to not move. Um, it's their comfort zone. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and the world's just going to have people that are like that until God fixes it. And we have to accept that. You know, the New Testament writers were very blunt about it. This occasion with Jesus shows it. Um, I mean, this is a place where everybody should get along. <laughs> They're having a party, for goodness sake. And yet, it's, 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 there's a lot of mean people here. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go. Um, and here's Jesus just being unapologetic. Um, was tonight fruitful and beneficial? It's been a little while since I've asked you that here at study. This is where we say goodbye to our online audience. Goodbye. <laughs>